So we announced this prize about nine months ago. We're three quarters of a year into a prize that extends until the end of 2014. Uh, so we're at the beginning of what may be a fairly long haul. And throughout that time, we have not just one cohesive audience that we need to reach, but actually a, a set of audiences that may vary over time. In the early years, a lot of our effort here at XPRIZE will be focused on making sure that we have all the teams that we need to really make this uh, an exciting, robust competition that has inter an international flavor to it, and most importantly, has teams that are actually capable of winning. Uh, that's hugely important to us. We've been doing a good job of that, I think, already, and I'll talk to you more about the teams that we have, but that's going to continue to be a major focus of ours until registration closes, which still doesn't happen for another couple of years. Uh, we're also working to build up our level of credibility by getting letters of endorsement or support from celebrities and from uh, major space industry experts. So there was a question earlier about NASA. We have a letter of endorsement from the NASA administrator as well as from the administrator of the Japanese Space Agency and some other softer uh, letters of support from uh, some of the other space agencies. We have people like Bill Nye the Science Guy and Arthur C. Clarke who have also done some YouTube video clips for us just sort of saying, hey, I'm really excited that this is happening in my lifetime and, and I, I can't wait to see someone win. Uh, and that helps us because it does help us engage John Q. Public, but it also helps when the teams are going out and trying to recruit financiers. They're often being asked the same question of, has NASA given you permission? Why do you think you can do this when they have it? Uh, and this helps them sort of say, hey, I'm not a crazy guy. I have some... Uh, some support behind me. So we've been reaching out to those experts and we'll continue to do so. We're also educating the future customers and that involves going into NASA or the European Space Agency and saying, hey, this capability is going to be here in a few years. It is to your benefit to learn how to purchase it, to learn how to work with it, because ultimately it's going to save NASA money and allow them to do more missions on a fixed budget. Um, we're also trying to find those those customers and financiers outside of government and private industry. So maybe Hollywood wants to get some film actually from the lunar surface to use in the next blockbuster or video game or whatever, other industries like that. We try to make sure that the prize is market neutral while still stimulating the market for all the teams on the back end at the same time. And of course a huge component of this is educating students uh, and people, students of all ages around the world, getting them excited about space again in a way that they haven't been since the late 60s. Uh, we did a quick hand raise of who wasn't alive during Apollo. Actually, half of the population on Earth wasn't alive the last time we were on the moon. Uh, I'm in that group. For people like me, Apollo is a, is a picture in a history textbook or it's a story from our parents rather than a direct personal memory. Uh, and we want to very much change that and take advantage of all the great technologies that Google and other companies are doing to push that out and allow people to watch these things happening in basically real time and high def and really feel like they are there and they are a part of this. Uh, next slide, please. Totally random question. Please. Yeah. This could be like a great TV show. Yes. Competition. Mm -hmm. I just like it's, yeah. it's like the Amazing Race. Um, yeah. Show. yeah. I mean, is that something you guys have thought about? Yeah, absolutely. Like as, as you said, this is uh, there's there's great TV both from the footage of the landing itself to the sort of human story about how did I form a team and how is my team better than that team and you know when the guy has to mortgage his house to fund the team and the spouse doesn't like it and all those kind of things. So we're very much looking into how to best do those in ways that are uh, appealing and exciting that build positively on our brand and on Google's brand and also are fair to all the teams. We don't want to bias more than we have to towards the English speaking teams or towards the American teams, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But it's something we very much have an eye to. Um, a little silly for me to be talking to you all about this, but just two quick slides about why Google uh, should care about this prize, why Google staffers should, why you know the, the Google management has decided to get behind this. Obviously, space and space data is incredibly important to a number of products that Google already has out there. You've been doing some of these for years. Google Earth, which is built off of uh, uh, radar topography uh, mapping information that was taken from the NASA Space Shuttle and then follow-on commercial satellite imagery. You've launched Sky recently and just has these stunningly beautiful pictures, which hopefully is driving a lot of traffic to your website, getting a lot of downloads to you, but also just stimulating people to get excited about math and science and all the cool things that are part of your don't be evil mantra. Next slide, please, Becky. And of course, one day you're all going to work on the moon, which is exciting. Um, but I think that there is, there is a mutual belief among Google and the XPRIZE Foundation that a number of great things, not just a technology, but a number of great things are going to come out of this prize. The technology is enormously important and will not just be applied to space. It will be spun out and applied to the medical industries and other industries as space flight technologies always have since the early days of NASA. 
it's going to create a, a huge amount of compelling content which is going to be pushed out via YouTube and Picasa and all the other Google products and things like that, uh, which will help you in your goal of organizing the world's information and pushing it out to people. And it's really going to reach out to those children who weren't alive during Apollo and who have lost their reason to care about space and have found other things to care about. It's going to make them interested in space again, which in turn is going to have uh, some ripple effects in terms of just getting people interested in science, technology, engineering, and math, and, and wanting to work in that field, which ultimately leads to more and better job applicants here at Google. Next slide, please. So this is a, a fairly audacious goal, right? A private company putting something on the moon, which nobody has done since 1976, which the United States and the Soviet Union are the only two people to have ever done in the history of the world. Why do we think that some ragtag group of guys and gals from some country who knows where is going to be able to do this? Uh, well, we actually have some pretty good historical analogs about why we think this might happen. Next slide, please. Uh, prizes have a, a long and a really impressive history. Uh, some of them you may be familiar with even though you didn't know they were prizes. Uh, so probably all of you know the name Charles Lindbergh and could tell me if I asked that Charles Lindbergh was the first person to make a transatlantic flight. But you may not have known that he did that to win a prize. Uh, this little shorter guy here named Raymond Ortega was a wealthy gentleman. He owned a bunch of hotels. Uh, he liked airplanes. He thought they were cool. He thought they maybe were important for business. So one day he wrote in a letter to the editor of a, of a trade magazine at the time and just said, hey, I'm offering this prize. It's $25,000 for the first person to fly without stopping from New York to Paris or Paris to New York. And that's it. Uh, and that was that prize was not all that much money, even in current money, but it was enough money to get people interested. And so what happened was all the leaving aviation experts of the time, who primarily lived in the U.S. or France, which is why it was New York to Paris, uh, got excited about this, and it really lit a fire under them, and it gave them all a common goal to work on. So instead of just being barnstormers who would fly people around in loops until they threw up, which is what most pilots did for money in those days, uh, they had a, a real technological goal that had importance as defined by someone. So you see all these people, some of these names, Admiral Byrd may be familiar to you from his polar explosions and things like that. Uh, and this guy Charles Lindbergh, who at the time was a nobody, he was a, a junior mail route pilot out of St. Louis. No one in the industry had ever heard of him, no one in the industry had any reason to have heard of him. But this prize really got him excited, it got his brain working, and it gave him a reason to go into his local venture capital community, or whatever the equivalent in the day was, and say, hey, I, I want to pursue this prize. I think I can win and return on your investment. And if I do, I think it's going to make the city of St. Louis an aviation hub, uh, which actually turned out to be true for quite some time. Next time, slide, please. Uh, he wrote a book about this called Spirit of St. Louis, which is actually a great book I recommend. But if you read through that and through other historical accounts, you realize that for this prize, you had nine teams from around the world competing. They spent 16 times the prize value trying to win. So that, that right there is a, is a great leveraging factor that says if you want a problem solved, rather than just giving your dollars to one person or one entity to do research on it and getting a one-to-one -one return, you can put out a prize and start getting these 10-to-1 returns or 16-to-1 returns like we see. But if you see the numbers of what happened after, um, after his flight, it shows that prizes also generally aren't won as stunts, something someone does once just to win the prize and then puts the thing in in the museum and never does it again, uh, it often leads to an enormous industry. In the case of this prize, this is really what made the modern aviation industry. And for anyone who's taken a transatlantic or cross-country flight recently, uh, you sort of have, have Lindbergh and Raymond Ortega to thank. Next slide, please. Uh, that was not the only prize going back several hundred years, the Longitude Act. Uh, this is what created the British Armada and really wrote Western history uh, as, as it is today. Uh, prior to that prize being offered, no sailor had the ability, they could tell their latitude based on the movement of the stars, but no sailor had the ability to tell their longitude. And so entire fleets would be lost at sea because they just didn't, simply did not know where they were. They would run aground or they would run out of fresh water and other supplies uh, and just lose entire fleets. That happened to the Spanish many times. It happened to the British prior to winning this prize. They put out this prize, which was offered mainly by astronomers. Everyone assumed an astronomer would win because that was the common wisdom of how someone would eventually crack this nut. Uh, and eventually it was won by someone who built this watch here, which was just an incredibly accurate timepiece that would re retain its accuracy with the swaying of the boat and with changes in temperature as you go from the poles to the equator and all these other things. And all of a sudden the British had a, a naval tool that no one else had and it allowed their, their armies to really uh, sort of conquer the others of the time. Uh, there are a bunch of others, the Kramer Prize for human-powered flight across the Atlantic, DARPA Grand Challenges, et cetera, et cetera.